in this series of talks on the Panchakoshas, the five bodies, I want to begin with dealing with the spinal system and the yoga of the spine, if I could use such a term. First, in Western medicine, they talk of the body as having six systems. And these systems are beautifully depicted in the mural as the skeletal structure of the body, the nervous system, the bloodstream or circulatory system, the major organs of the body, the glandular bodies, and the nervous system. In yoga, we actually talk about nine systems of the body, because we talk of the body in a much more superlative way than does Western anatomy and physiology. And so we talk of a pranic system made up of prana nadis, as the physical body has nadis in the bloodstream and the nervous system, we talk of prana nadis. In the mental body, we talk of satarai, flows of mind force and bindus. And in the ninth system, the chakras, of which there are 12. And a beautiful depiction to my left of the 12 chakras of the body, six associated with pinda, or the physical system, which contains the spine in the physical body and the brain, and six chakras in the higher body, which is referred to as anda, meaning an egg. Mm -hmm. The brahmanda, the hiranyagarbha, mm -hmm. superlative terms used in Sanskrit to discuss the higher nature of man. Now, if we were studying only Western anatomy, clinical anatomy and physiology, we'd be talking only about the physical body. But I mentioned Panchakosha, five bodies. The yoga system of anatomy and physiology requires that you understand the nature of a multi-bodied creature called man, of which the first body or physical body, Anamaya Kosha, is called the food body, belongs to Bhu, the lowest plane, Bhu Loka, the food plane, the cellular plane. Then there is a second body called a Pranamaya Kosha, the body or sheath of Prana. This is the vital body in which we find the emotions at work. All of your emotions are associated with pranic movement. There are 13 pranas. Then there is the manamaya kosha. This is the mind body. Mano is plural. It means manas, consciousness, and chitta, which is subconsciousness. And so subconsciousness and consciousness are linked together in the yogic system as manamaya kosha. Then the high superconscious mind, the buddhi, the prema, the cha, the pra, the chaitana, these are all referred to as vijnana maya kosha, the superlative vi, hmm? giving a very high meaning to jnana, which means wisdom, the superlative plane of wisdom, vijnana maya kosha. In Vedanta, this is called the plane of the buddhi, chaitana or pra. Hmm? Then there is the highest plane of all, that part of the universe which is yours. And is identified in the world of chakras, the spiritual body, if you wish, as Anandamaya Kosha. And when we start talking about the spinal system itself, where we have to talk about the highest nature of energy flowing through man from the chakras through the supramental mind through consciousness, through the subconsciousness, into the physical body, through the pranic uh, bridge, so to speak. It is prana that keeps this all together. And then down in the physical body, we have to talk about organs, glands, and the so-called six body systems of Western medicine. Now, I'm going to talk on all of these eventually. But this evening, I want to confine my talk mostly to the human spine, hmm? that which is called Brahmadanda, the staff of God. But I can't talk about this human spine as physical alone, because I will be continually referring to the metaphysical concepts in the yoga, and particularly that associated with Shakti, 
and a particular kind of Shakti called Kundalini that is the very crux of your understanding in Tantra and in Adhyatmaka Yoga. But unless you understand something first about your spine, you are not going to understand the superlative nature of your spiritual body or your higher body. But in undertaking this study of spiritual anatomy or yoga anatomy and yoga physiology, please keep in mind that there are five bodies. Yoga without the study of these five bodies will take you only into the most mundane study of man as matter. You must understand this yogic concept if you are to keep the yogic flow of consciousness. Now I'm a bit embarrassed when Westerners approach me and they talk about the chakras as though the chakras were very physical. And they talk about people who are into sex as being much into their first chakra. And people who are into love, they're much into their fourth chakra. And intellectuals, they're much into their sixth chakra. And religious people, they're much into their seventh chakra. This is absolute nonsense. Hmm? It's got nothing to do with the chakras at all. And the chakras are not at that level, nor are they operated at that level at all. So I want you to understand <clears throat> some basic ideas that are yogic about the brain and the spinal system. Where to start? Well, first, let's start with the human body and its skeletal system. The skeletal structure of man, the bony structure of man, is built around the spine, the spinal column. And this spinal column is made up of 33 bony processes. Each of these processes is joined one to another above and below and uh, associated with these 33 bony processes are 31 sets of spinal nerves. 33 bones, 31 sets of nerves. Now on top of this spinal skeletal structure is your skull, your head. Hmm? And associated with the mid part, the thoracic part, is the shoulder and arm section of the body. Associated with the sacro-pelvic area is your hips and ultimately your legs. Now all of the nerves that come out from your brain pass down through a central canal, an opening within the spinal bony process, the, the spine, and essentially the spine is to protect those nerves. There is a giant nerve comes down through the center of these 33 bones. Well, it doesn't really pass all the way through. Entering the top of your spine at 1C, that's the first cervical bone, the spinal cord terminates into a giant set of nerves at the first lumbar, sometimes the second. It depends on how your spinal cord is developed. I was taught originally that they terminated at L1, but I have a good Russian textbook that says they find 8% of Russians with the spinal cord terminating at L2. And after that, a great network of nerves that come out, a caudal appendage, which is known by the term caudal equinus, literally the horse's tail. You know how a horse has the bony part of its tail and then on the end of the tail many hairs come out? Well, in that particular way, at the end of your spinal cord, hairy-like nerves come out into your hips, your pelvis, the sacral area, and on down your legs. In fact, one giant pair of nerves, one on the left side and one on the right side, proceed from what is first triune nerves. They become one nerve and pass down your leg to the top of your feet. We call these Vajranadi. And these Vajranadi are known in the West as the sciatic nerves. Just imagine we have names in Sanskrit for every nerve in the body. There are 729 nerve groups in the body. We have a Sanskrit term for every one of these 720 plus the nadis, the higher nadis that move into nine lower chakras. There are no nerves associated with the three highest chakras. Now your spinal bones are divided into groups. In the upper part of the spine, you have seven bones in the neck area, or seven cervical bones. 
Then from the lower neck area down through the thorax, that is through the dorsal area of your body, are 12 bones. These are either called thoracic vertebral bones or dorsal spinal bones. There are 12. Then five bones, one after another, make up the lumbar area in the back associated with the pelvis. Then there are five smaller bones that in most of us in the adult state ossify or hold together. They lose their independence and join together into the sacral body of the spine. Sacral, sacred area of the body. Oh, how I wish man still held his pelvis and his sacral area to be sacred. It is from the Latin hmm, for the word sacred. And it should be a sacred place. And then finally, the last five bones of the body, which if you had a tail, would be outside of the body, wiggling like a tail, is called the coccyx. And generally in the adult stage, these also grow together, solidify. So that five coccyxial bones grow together, five sacral bones grow together, and often in ossification, other bones grow together. But out of 33 bones, 10 ossify together. Hmm? So that in the end, you only have 24 working bones, articulate bones of your spine. This spine is to protect the sensitive nerves arising in your cranium, arising in your skull, and within the skull, protected by the bony skull, some of those nerves come out. For instance, of the cranial nerves, 12 pair, only one pair get out from the skull itself. That's the tenth cranial nerves. And this pair of nerves comes down through the jugular foramen, along the throat, the jugular vein, and activate the heart and the lungs and the digestive system, and therefore are called the pneumogastric nerves. Pneumo, air, associated with the lungs, and gastric, associated with the digestive system. These pneumogastric nerves, of which there is the left and the right, are also called the vagus nerves, left and right vagus nerve. By far and large, the left vagus nerve activates your system, while the right vagus nerve inhibits hmm, in one of the systems. But we'll have to go into that much more as we go along. But there are nerves that come down from the cranium as the spinal cord. And then nerves come out, 31 sets of nerves come out from the spine, the spinal cord, or from a great periphery on each side of your spine. The spinal cord is called Shushum Nadi, which literally means the royal road. While the two giant ganglia that hang on each side of the spine are called the left ganglia, on the left side of the body is called Ida Nadi, I-D-A Nadi. While on the right side of the spine, the right peripheral ganglion is called Pingala Nadi. These nerves belong to the central nervous system and are part of your parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is made up of nerves from the cranium to the sacral area of your spine. Now you have another system which is called the sympathetic system, which is a very short nervous system that is inside of your thorax and the center of that sympathetic nervous system is a group of nerves belonging to the sympathetic nervous system and ganglia thereof that join together the two adrenal glands on top of your kidneys. This group of nerves centering the sympathetic nervous system is called the solar medullaris or the solar plexus. In yoga we teach that the solar plexus, the sun center, the sun brain, is made up of 12 radial nerves. <clears throat> In the west, they narrow down the solar medullaris to the sympathetic nerve link between the adrenal glands, and therefore much associated with anxiety, fear, phobia, and so on. And why, in yoga, the sun is given a negative connotation as far as the nervous system is concerned. But in Tantra, in the, the yoga dealing with Kundalini arousal, its maintenance, its worship, its control, and the ultimate Kundalini experience, the solar plexus is much more 
then the West takes in. Remember when we're talking about the Western medical system, we're talking about ekkakosha, one body. Here we're talking about five bodies. But even in the physical system, yoga goes farther than this and says there are 12 radial nerves that meet in the solar plexus. These are made up of six pairs of nerves, hmm? six times two making 12. From the top come the two vagai nadi, the vagus nerves. Hmm? So that's your first pair, two. You've got another pair arising and joining into the sympathetic system, the mesentery. And the mesentery is described as the greater and the lesser, as are also the splanchic nerves. So two mesentery, two sets of splanchnik, that's two, four, six. Hmm? Two sets of pelvic nerves that come up from the base of the spine through the pelvis and the sacrum into the solar plexus. And then the solar nerves themselves, which join together the adrenal glands. And so we have 12 nerves in all. And these are just like a giant sunburst of energy in your solar plexus. And it is this solar plexus that is activated in the newborn baby when it takes its first breath of life. The energy, the pranic energy, coming through both the physical nadis and through the prana nadis, activate the solar plexus, the sun center. And the jiva, the living self, enters the solar plexus. Now, later on, we can shift this jiva around. And I accept that the reason the Western medical people accept that the solar medullaris, the solar plexus, is a very restricted part of the sympathetic nervous system to the fact that the average person is no longer living in his solar plexus. We are children of the sun and we should be living in our solar plexus. But what happens with the Pashu? Now the Pashu is a very poorly undeveloped human being. Pashu in this case means an animal. And he lives for nothing but to eat and sleep and rut. Hmm? Eat, sleep and propagate. And so he moves the jiva down here into the pelvis. Huh? And all of his action is sexual. There's no life in his solar plexus at all. He's lost his sun center. He's a pashu, he's an animal. Eating, sleeping, hmm? and living for sex only. So that kind of individual is down here. And that's a large percentage of mankind and womankind today. They live for nothing but the pleasure of the pelvis. Hmm? Nothing more. They live for the pleasure, as it says, of the goddess, goddess Parvati. One of her 51 body parts is called Kamakiya, hmm? literally the entrance to desire. And we have a city here in northern India in Assam, as you know, called Kamakiya, where it is believed when Shiva carrying his dead wife Sadi in the cosmic dance that the parts of her fell off from the body, or there's another story that Vishnu with his discus through the discus 51 times at Shiva, cutting off the fingers, the wrists, and the arms of Devi who fell all over the world. And there are 51 holy places in Tantra, as you know. And one, Kamakya, means where her vagina fell. Hmm? Kamakya, the gate to pleasure. Kama means desire. Hmm? And people who are living down in this Kama, Kamaloka, the world of desire. Hmm? Now we get a lot of people get up into the fourth area here, the fourth chakra, as we're saying, and they're all full of love. Oh, I love you. Hello, dear. Herzl, Herzl, amore, amore. Huh? Whatever it happens to be. They're just still, it doesn't mean anything at all, by the way. Huh? They're just all emotional. Hmm? There are others who get up the head here, and they're all intellectual. Oh, God does not really exist in the, uh, in the heart of man. He exists in the mind of man. You know, and he's the great, he's got all of his intellect up here and he's captured the real living self out of the solar plexus, out of the sun center, and has put it up into his higher intellect and that poor soul is trapped in this intellect. So there are three places where the real nature of man gets trapped, pulled away from the solar plexus, and this solar plexus is the center of Shiva, the center of goodness. It is called Hara, huh? Hara, as in Hara Hara Shiva, hmm? 
we sing the name of Shiva. Hara, 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 hara. Hara Shivaya. That's the energy right down here in the solar plexus. Hara isn't here, Hara isn't here, Hara isn't here, and Hara isn't Hara Hara. Out of the moat. There are verbal personalities too. Ba 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 ba. They just talk all the time, say absolutely nothing. Huh? They're suffering from verbal diarrhea. Huh? We've got to get the self back here. And this is the purpose of yoga, by the way, is to get this energy of the jiva, the jiva shakti, the jiva atman, back to the solar plexus. And hence, in yoga, the tremendous concept of this solar plexus, the sun center. Here is where life began. And here is where life finally leaves your body. And in some sections of the tantra, this is where the experience of kundalini starts. Not at the base of the spine. It must start in the solar plexus and then go to the base of the spine. In certain meditations in the Tantra, they start in the first center and go up through the chakras, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. Others in the prana go two, three, four, one, five, six. Hmm? And in some, they start at three. After you have controlled the first and second chakra, Muladhara chakra and Swadhisthana chakra, then the energy is taken up from the first, third center, not the first, hmm, in a high chakric meditation. And that's the reason for it. But listen, before we get off into the superlatives of Kundalini world, Kundalini Loka, hmm? because it is a plane of mind while we talk of it in this way, let us come back and talk about the three brains of the body. Hmm? I've mentioned the solar plexus. This solar plexus, by the way, is made up of medullaric tissue, medullaris, solar medullaris. And you have in the midst of your brain, the lower brain, a medullaric area called medulla oblongata. Hmm? The outcropping at the top of your spine is an egg-shaped, oblong shape called medulla oblongata. That brain, by the way, is associated with the moon or chandra. This here is the sun, solar plexus here. This is the moon, the lunar plexus. You will recognize you Italian people from Latina Luna. And if you don't look after this plexus up here, you become a, a lunatic. You suffer from lunacy, moon madness. In Sanskrit, we say you suffer from soma madness. Soma is the moon. Hmm? Soma, Chandra, so many words for the moon. But you suffer from soma madness. Hmm? Soma Ishwara is a name for Shiva. A high name for the Shiva who knows how to deal with the liquor, with the uh, material that is produced by the glands in the brain, and particularly the gland that makes soma itself. Soma is a Sanskrit word for nectar, and is one of the glandular fluids, autocoids or auto acids, made by that pineal gland in your brain. So here is the lunar brain up in your head influenced by the moon. The brain filled with water is pulled like the seas or a lake by the moon. And this is why people at Amavasi New Moon, at Chandra Purnima at Full Moon, go a little bit mad. Hmm? They are somaites. Hmm? They are people who are influenced by that glandular juices made by the brain. And most of you, if you've ever worked in institutions, people go a little crazy eh, at the change of the moon. In lunatic asylums, it's the worst time for the nurses and doctors. Eh? A lot of babies are born at this time of madness. In town, like Pondicherry, we have more drunks and mad people in the jails during the change of the moon than at any other time. And the authorities all say, well, here it is, the weird time of the month again. It's Amavasi, new moon, or it's Chandra Purnima, full moon, and many, many people hmm, are influenced by the moon. How about you? When the new moon comes, do you sit outside and go, oh, and howl to the moon? Are you a little bit mad? Hmm? Well, all yogis should be a little bit mad. Hmm? You have an earth brain, too. Hmm? As you have a lunar brain in your head and a solar brain in your stomach, you have an earth brain at the base of your spinal cord. The end of your spinal cord has an outcropping, like a spear. 
And in fact, in symbology, this is the spear of Lord Subramanian, son of Shiva, Kartikeya, Lord of War. He carries a spear in his hand. The shaft of the spear is your spinal cord. And the outcropping of the head of the spear is your conus medullaris. Hmm? Conus cone, medullaris brain, a conical brain at the base of your spine, which is referred to as the earth brain. Hmm? And it is in this earth brain that a powerful inborn, born with you, but not operating, quiet shakti resides, at least in potential. It is symbolized by a three-coiled snake with its tail in its mouth in the higher Adhyatmaka Yoga and in Tantra. This inert, quiet, undeveloped energy is referred to as Kanda Shakti. Kanda is the name for the conus medullaris in the body, Kanda, as in Kanda Swami. Lord Subramanian is called Kanda Swami. It is said he lives in a cave at the lower part of the spine, so he's also called Skanda Swami. Skanda Guha is that part of the opening at the base uh, of your spine between the vertebral processes where this Kanda, where the end of your spinal cord outcrops. This word Kanda is also the root of the word Kunda, as in Kundali. It is said that there is a female form of the force called Kanda. It is called Kandali, or corrupted to Kundalini. And tantrics talk about Kundalini Shakti, although it is redundant to do so, because Kundali itself means the Shakti of the Kanda. So when we say Kundalini Shakti, we're saying Kanda Shakti Shakti. It's redundant to say the term. And you will not hear Indians saying Kundalini Shakti. They will say Kundalini, and that's the end of it. Now there's a wonderful part about this Kanda holding the Kundalini. This is your earth brain. And as this lunar brain is influenced by the moon, as this solar brain is activated by the sun, and please accept that much of your nervous system, your glandular system, is photosensitive. It works to light. We have a whole system in our body that works on diurnal rhythms governed by the solar plexus. When the sun comes up, the solar plexus acts and certain things work in your body. When the sun goes down, the solar plexus reacts uh, and certain things shut down in your body and other things begin. It is your sun center, the solar plexus, that activates your biorhythms, your daily activity. It is the brain that controls the soma, which can be interpreted in many ways. Hmm? The soma is said to be a magnetic juice. And in your body, we have energies that are carried through the liquids of the body, including fluids in your nervous system, that are said to be biomagnetic. That is, the body produces a magnetic flux. And around every organ in your body, around every function of your body, there is an electrodynamic or biomagnetic field. These biomagnetic fields, by the way, are ascertainable. Science talks about these. They are magnetometers which actually read these various fields. And they can tell you about the various plexi in the body and their electrodynamic fields, EDF, or their biomagnetic fields. And every part of your spine, every plexus of your spine, from the lower plexus, which is the sacral plexus, a higher pelvic plexus, a lower subhypogastric plexus, the gastric plexus or solar plexus, the cardiac pneumoplexus in the chest, the plexus at the throat here associated with Vashuddha chakra, the fifth center, and this is associated with glandular bodies also at the throat, the thyroid, parathyroid glands, as each of the chakras is associated. And then into the front part of your brain, the cavernous plexus, and the top of your head, the coronal plexus. Now each of these plexi, nerve centers, has an electrodynamic flux. And scientists now looking into the field of chakras have also discovered that in advanced yogi, not in bogies or rogies or old fogies. Hmm? But in the authentic yogi, 
there are electrodynamic fluxes associated with the chakras uh, uh, as well. The chakras are not in everyone. The chakras are not awake, let's put it that way. And when I talk to you about chakras, I will tell you, you are born with one chak chakra open out of 12. Hmm? By your birth, one chakra is activated. The three higher chakras, 10, 11, and 12 at the top of the head, are also activated by the act of birth. And these are the, uh, these are the three wise men of the scriptures that attend every birth, hmm? the three magi. But on your own, only one chakra is activated by your birth. Chakras may be activated by pranic force, by mental force, by the way you live, by certain body cycles. They may be activated by yoga. In fact, each of the yogas is associated with a chakra. Hatha yoga is used to open the first chakra, muladhara. Second chakra, swadhisthana, jnana yoga. Pranayama is to open the third chakra, manipura chakra. Karma yoga is to open the heart center of anahata chakra. Raja Yoga or Astanga Yoga is to open the Shudaka Chakra at the throat. Agya Chakra, the center of the brain, is activated by the study of Yantra and Yantra, sometimes called Madra Yoga. Mantra is the yoga that activates the seventh center, Sahasrara Chakra, hence the Mantra Laya. Hmm? The eighth center is activated by Laya Yoga. The ninth chakra is activated by bhakti, para bhakti, yoga bhakti, not ordinary bhakti. The 10th, 11th, and 12th centers are open on their own. Let me come back to this earth center, hmm? this khanda at the base of your spine. <clears throat> Residing in this group of medullary cells, medullary tissue, a special kind of tissue of which the brain is made up. Hmm? Although there is a medullaris in the kidneys and other major organs of the body, but the term here that I'm using exclusively means that type of matter that is associated with activated brains. An earth center in the kanda, the conus medullaris, the sun center in your solar plexus, and the lunar plexus in your brain of the medulla oblongata. In the lower plexus of the body <coughs> associated with this center, there are nerve impulses that seem to be associated with regeneration. Of course, we know that these centers are associated with generation. The pelvis and the sacral area are associated with the nerves and the plexus thereby that pass to the male generative organ to the female organ of reception where the child hmm, spends nine months in the mother and a child is born. What is the pattern that produces a baby? <clears throat> Some of you ladies are mothers. What did you have to do with producing this child? Did you sit down on the 40th day and say, today I'm going to make a nose? No? Did you sit down on the 48th day and say, it's time my baby had fingers? No, no. There's something at work building this baby. Hmm? And it's part and parcel of your nervous system. It's inborn. It's only activated hmm, when it's time to have a baby. This is a part of the generative impulse in man to reproduce, produce and reproduce. But listen, in this same conus medullaris is the pattern of your body and my body. Do you think the universe would have been so dumb to have made us without a master plan? Look, if I want to build a ship, and I call Bombay and I'd say, I'd like the Navy Yards in Bombay to build me a ship. They'd say, well, first, sir, we'll make a plan for the ship. Then we'll build the ship to this plan so that you will know where every single piece of metal, <coughs> every board, every rivet, every weld, every electrical wire, <coughs> where everything is in that ship. And when this ship is launched and finished, we'll give you a copy of that plan so that if anything goes wrong in your ship, you will have a master plan. Now look, there's not an aircraft in the world that goes into the air without a master plan along with the pilot, another master plan on the ground with the mechanics, another copy of that master plan with the makers. And if anything goes wrong with that aircraft or ship or whatever it is, there is a plan. This very camera that is taking 
uh, this picture has a schematic diagram outlining everything in this camera so that if it goes wrong a repairman can find the problem. Now do you think the Japanese would have made such a beautiful video set and not sent us a plan? Huh? Do you think that Boeing will make an aircraft and not give you a plan? Do you think that the big shipbuilders on the Clyde in Scotland would build you a ship and not give you a plan? Then let me ask you this. Do you think God built you and didn't give you a plan? Huh? You are much more complicated than the biggest British battleship ever built. You are more complicated and wonderful than the biggest Airbus flying today. Huh? You are more wonderful in your senses than the camera that takes my photo and records my voice. And do you think there isn't a plan for you? You say, well, the master builder must have it. No, no, man has this whole thing in his five bodies, and he can learn about how he is built in these five bodies. And this is what the study of yoga is all about. But on top of this, there is a part of your nervous system. This is the kanda, the conus medullaris, that carries the inbuilt plan for your body. And there are people like the late Gopi Krishna, who just recently died, a great authority on Kundalini says, if we can only find how to properly arouse Kundalini, that Kundalini will cure every disease known to man. All neurological disturbances will disappear, cancer will disappear. You'll even be able to grow an arm if you've lost an arm again. Well, isn't this a rather shocking piece of information? Man thinks himself to be the height of creation, but if he loses an arm or a leg or a body part, he can't grow it back, or he doesn't. Yogis say he could if he knew how. Look, a lizard just ran, ran by without a tail. Hmm? No doubt one of the puppies was chasing the lizard, caught it by the tail, and the lizard flicked off its tail. But you know what? See that same lizard a month from now, he's got a new tail. Hmm, I wonder who's the height of evolution. The lizard can lose a tail and grow a new one. Can you lose an arm and grow a new one? Other creatures can regrow body parts. If a tadpole loses its leg, it grows another leg. Hmm? Now the secret of that is in the kanda at the base of the spine of all vertebrate creatures. It's at the base of your spine too, the base of mine, but it's dormant. It's inactive because we haven't aroused this energy properly. We're putting out all our energy verbally, through the eyes, through sex drive, anything to escape this divine knowledge hmm, of who and what we are and correcting and rebuilding our body as is needed. That plan is in the Kanda. I believe that this part of the knowledge of Kundalini, by the way, is more important than the so-called arousal of kundalini for fun and games. What does the average person want to arouse kundalini for? To bounce in the air? To simply have another experience that he didn't have on LSD or coke or whatever it happens to be? Is that what he wants kundalini for? I've asked thousands of young people like you who come to me, what do you want kundalini aroused for? Fun, sorry, fun. No, that's not what kundalini is for. And better we forget all of that. Hmm? and learn the first nature of kundalini is for the reproduction of every cell in your body, a whole new body, a satchitananda deha, a body totally rebuilt, hmm? a body virtually deathless. Hmm? And is this possible? Well, I think it is. We have yogis alive in India today, many of them well over a century, rejuvenating their body. Associated with this ashram are a number of sadhus more than a century old, one nearly 240 years of age. A few years ago, at Tapavanan, Gyanananda Giri died there at 476 years of age. Records were kept of his life by the British during British time. And as you know, we are going to celebrate in a few days' time our own guru's birthday here. This will be the 111th death ceremony, the Aradnaha of Sri Kambli Swami, also called Gyanan Nadgiri. Swamiji was 504 years of age at his death. Now this is, shocks our mind if we hear this. And you know that Swamiji's guru was 1,005 years of age at his death? This is our tradition. 
Agastya Rishi, who is the founder of this order, was 6,666 years of age of his death. And we talk of Vashishta Rishi as living one day short of 10,000 years, 9,999 9, years, less a day of 10,000 years. Now, is this just talk in yoga about these great Chiranjivi, these great immortals? And according to our tradition, we have six yogis, the six immortals who are alive in India today, who since their birth are supposedly really not died. The Chinese took up this theme, the same six immortals in the Chinese philosophy, in Chinese Tantra, hmm, are the same six Indian immortals. Hmm. These are six great rishis of yoga, who are claimed to be alive in India today, because they rejuvenate their body by the knowledge of this kanda. Now, I'm not very concerned with immortality myself. There are times I run out of steam and I'm ready to die. And I think the day will come that I will not only be ready to die, but I will die. And I will happily do so. And I don't know about you, but I think the day will come when you will want to die too. But until then, don't die. Most people, when they die, don't want to. Hmm? Their life's work is not done. Is your life's work done? Well, you say no because you don't even know what it is. So for some of us, we still have to find out what is our dharma. Then when you find out that dharma, you need to do it. And what if I told you, you need 25 lifetimes to fill that dharma? And you say, man, I have to die and be born again and die and be born again 25 times. Yes, you can choose that way. That's the hard way. Or why don't you do it all in one lifetime? Hmm? And that's the real message of Kanda Shakti, Kundalini Shakti, is that this is a path to evolution, ultimate evolution in which that evolution is dependent upon a healthy body. You are not evolving in a sick body. Therefore, you have to overcome that sickness. Hmm? And to overcome that sickness for whatever time you need, maybe you need only a short period of time, you require that you enter into this study. Hmm? Now, there are some natural inborn problems. Hmm? And there are some problems you might not even recognize. Of course, the first problem is no information. Hmm? You lack information. Somebody tells you about this, you say, yeah, yeah, I want that. But have you heard about health? Yeah, yeah, you want that, but are you healthy? No, you've got to learn about how to be healthy. You hear about happiness, you want that? Yeah, yeah. Man, I want happiness. But do you have happiness? No, you have to learn to have happiness. And so it is about this aspect of yoga. You need some information. Then when you get the information, you know how to deal with body problems. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of these main problems associated with the spine alone. Hmm? Your spinal cord, which is an outcropping of your brain, comes down through the bony processes of your spine. Your spine protects this spinal cord. And out from this spine comes 31 sets of nerves activating every organ in your body. Hmm? You've all seen the chart in my yoga correspondence course of the brain and the human spine and the sets of nerves coming out to each of the body organs. Every single organ in your body is vivified. Hmm? It is innervated. It gets energy from your nerves, your spinal nerves. It is innervated hmm, by another set of nerves. Those which innervate or activate the spinal system are known by the names of devas, masculine gods, those that inhibit by devas. So there's a whole set of devas and devis associated with the spine. The spinal cord itself is called Shushum Nadi, the royal road. It actually means a red carpet up through your spine. The spinal bones are called Brahmadanda, the staff of God. Hmm? Then this spinal cord is hollow. It has a canalis centralis, hmm? a central canal. Now, in the average adult human being, this canal has collapsed or it's plugged up with phlegm. The same phlegm you get in your chest or your nose when you have a cold gets into this hollow spinal cord. And it inhibits the movement of Kundalini Shakti up within Shushum Nadi. By the way, within the Shushum Nadi, when it is clear, there are two other psychic cords. One is called Vajrini or Vajranini and the other called Chitranini, through which energy as powerful as Kundalini passes. 
in Kundalini Upanishad. It says that the spinal cord, cord is like a sheath. And inside of this is a reed. And inside of the reed is a hollow grass. Hmm? And the sheath is called Shushum Nadi. The reed inside, which is hollow, hmm, is called Chitranadi or Chitranini. And inside of that is Vajranini, that which is the hollow inside of the grass. It's like a tube within a tube. In actual fact, each of these energies moves at a different speed of vibration. And in modern time, we could liken to a number of telephone signals passing over the same line. But each of these at a different frequency. As you know, when you pick up a telephone, in the old days, you had to be on a party line and everybody was on the one line. Then we learned how to put the various people onto the same line, but have their telephone activated at a different frequency. Now, if you phone out of Pondicherry, there's about 400 telephone calls going on the same line, but each at a different frequency. In that particular way, at least three different frequencies of nerve impulses are moving along your spinal cord. And simply because they're at different frequencies, they're moving at a different speed of vibration, they can occupy the same space. I don't really believe that they're a reed, a, a blade of grass inside of a reed, inside of a sheep. But this was the way it was explained in ancient times. But the problem, can this Shakti Kundalini that is in the Khanda at the base of the spine move up through this hollow spinal cord if the spinal cord is plugged or collapsed? In the average human cadaver, when the spine is open and the spinal cord is sliced open with a scalpel, with, with a, scalpel a knife, we find that it's plugged up inside with a piece of heavy Bakelite plastic-like material to about the size of mother or grandmother's knitting needle. Do you know what a knitting needle is? Where you knit socks, you make a pair of socks, a plastic knitting needle, just like that. Gray, dirty gray, plastic knitting needle right up inside of your spinal cord. Now, it goes without saying, no Shakti can move when the spinal cord is plugged. Hence, there are many, many practices in yoga to solvent this klishma, it is called. Klishma, a very vulgar word in Sanskrit. The dirtiest word, dirtier than mala or phlegm or toxins. It's a real dirty word, klishma. Hmm? It's so dirty that this word is associated with one of the great devils that was killed at uh, Diwali time. Do you remember the Naraka, the devil of filth? Hmm? His worst filth, that Naraka's filth that Krishna kills off, is called Kleshma. Hmm? That Kleshma plugs up the spine. It can be solvented. There are special yoga postures to solvent this material out of the spine and ultimately arouse the Shakti and allows it to pass up. Now, the Shushum Nadi, hollow, is lined with effervescent cells. There's only one other nerve column in your body lined with effervescent cells, cells that activate with life. And that is Murdini Nadi, the stem of the pineal gland, which is called Shiva Netra, or the eye of Shiva in Sanskrit. At one time, you know, we had a third eye out the top of the head. And it was on a long arm, and when you wanted to look around, you looked like this. And even neurologists admit that the pineal gland is a vestige that is left over from the past, and it was out through the top of your head. You have a hole in the top of your head, and you had a third eye outside of your head. Hmm? And this pulled inside through millions of years of development, and has finally turned under like a wizened flower, and is now your pineal gland. But that stem, of the pineal gland. You also have a stem, a stalk on the pituitary, on the, yes, pituitary gland, but the stalk of the pituitary gland is solid, it's not hollow. The Murdini Nadi, that stem that goes to the pineal gland, though, can light up, which accounts for white light meditation, a dazzling light that sometimes opens in the middle of meditation. This is the Shakti or the Soma chemicals that are activating these cells, luminous cells in the stem of the pineal gland. Now when the same soma, a blood red juice produced in your pineal gland, runs down inside of the spinal cord, it activates the walls. Hence it is called Shushum Nadi, or the royal corridor, or the pathway of the scarlet rug. You know there is the saying they rolled out the red carpet for his visit. 
Hmm? The king came to visit and they rolled out the red carpet. Well, this is a quote, by the way, from Kundalini Shakti. When the Shiva in you is aroused in the solar plexus, goes down and awakes into the sleeping beauty, the Kundalini, the prince is at the base of your spine. The two of them walk along a red rug pathway up into the throne room of God, Brahmarandraha, where their wedding takes place. The Soma activates the luminous cells in the hollow spinal cord of the spinal cord that isn't plugged. So the first thing you do, you have to unplug that spinal cord, and I know of no way by which jnana, that is knowledge, bhakti, devotion, prema, love, or anything else will work. Hmm? It may be that Tai Chi works or Zen meditation. I don't know. I've never heard of it. But I have heard and seen that yoga does what it says it does. Hmm? That it does solvent this kleshma that plugs up. Now there's another problem. In the Pranamaya Kosha, there are three granthis, three granthis, three knots. Brahma granthi towards the base of the spine. Vishnu Granti in the mid thoracic area and the upper thoracic area Mahadeva Granti or Shiva Granti. Now the reason it's not called Shiva Granti in the Pranamaya Kosha is that the gland at the throat here, the thyroid gland, is called Shiva Granti. So this is called Mahadeva Granti to make sure you understand that it's in the pranic body. And these knots stop energy from moving. One time my own guru was asked, why are these knots there? And my guru said, this is so no fool uh, can enter the kundalini field. As Jesus said in the Bible, there are thieves who even try to get into heaven at night via the back door, stealthily they want to climb into heaven. In the yogic system, it's not possible for a pashu, a fool, hmm, to get into the kundalini factor because there are these knots which stop him from passing through. And these knots require a certain initiation from your guru, you need to be given pranayamas that will pierce through these knots. You need to be given the proper mantras. There are five of them which will help you pierce through these grantis. And finally, by the grace of the guru, and this is one place the grace of the guru is really very physical. It is physical teachings, pranamaya kosha pranayamas, and mantras to help move through this pranamaya kosha to open up the psychic field in pranamaya kosha. Then there are barriers in the mind body. Hmm? The biggest barrier in the mind body is called asmita, means the echo, the ahamkara. So you can see there are not pe many people that you and I know who are going to make it because most of us are big egos. We are giant egos. And no ego is going to have the kundalini phenomenon, hmm? just that simply. Because the kundalini phenomenon, although it is individual for you, arouses the only energy in your body which is unipolar. All of the other energies we've been talking about in biomedic and magnetic fields are bipolar. There's only one unipolar energy in your body. Hmm? And that unipolar energy is associated only with the universal experience, and therefore there is no ego to it. The ultimate universal experience is the kundalini experiences which takes place in you as an individual, but after that you are no longer an individual. Hence, you need to know a great deal about the yoga of the spine. And we've just touched it. Hmm? We've just had a little insight to 33 bones that hold up your head, 31 nerves that come out between these bones that activate or inhibit every part of your body, <clears throat> nerve plexi along the spine in the physical body that activate glands in your body, the energy that comes down through the bindus and the nadis to activate these parts of the body. And finally, the supreme energy itself, which is in Anandamaya Kosha, the energy from the chakras. But listen, the energy from the chakras cannot come through your body unless you have opened the appropriate area. Not everybody has aroused chakras. As I told you before, the act of birth opens one chakra. Three are opened by nature with your birth. That's four out of 12. You've got eight to go. These other eight just don't open by luck or good fortune or having somebody tap you on your head with a peacock feather as they claim in Shaktipat. Nonsense. Hmm? I also accept Shaktipat. But tapping somebody on his 
head with a peacock feather and arousing his kundalini is nonsense. Hmm? Because you're up against the physical body and its kleshma, blocking up the spinal cord, the grantis in the pranamaya kosha, the mental blocks of the asmita, and certainly banging you on the head with a peacock feather. And doesn't change all of this. The real grace of the guru is in the knowledge of your body. And the knowledge of your body is a full-blown knowledge. Much of it taught as metaphysics in yoga, where we talk about chakras on a very high level. We have to bring this down to a very low level to teach you about your body. It is knowledge which you should have. So when we talk about the yoga systems of the body, we must talk at least of five bodies and nine systems in five bodies, not just six in the Western medical system. We must understand something about the chakras by their study and then apply our study into action. Knowledge of the chakras is not to arouse the chakras. Hmm? The chakras are aroused by applied knowledge or wisdom. And these teachings are given by gurus who are educated in this field. Some of them do not have the experience themselves, but can take you along the path because they've been guided so far by their guru, and then they have stopped. For whatever reason, maybe they're karma or they don't wish to go farther. But many gurus can give you information about the chakras and not had a chakric experience themselves. Hmm? But once you start into the chakric experience, you cannot remain in the mundane world. You cannot remain in the marketplace. I warn you of this. There are many people who want this high psychic kundalini experience. You will have to withdraw from the world. You will not be able to stand the noise and the hubbub of the world. It's not an experience for fun in the world. It's not another form of LSD. It's not another form of coke. It's not another form of marijuana. It's an experience which will force you to withdraw from the world. And if you don't, you will go insane. Gopi Krishna admits to the fact in his kundalini experience, he was 26 years insane, and he has said to me personally, I wish I had a kundalini guru, it could have saved, and saved me all of the problems. If you want to learn about a kundalini experience in the West, read Emanuel Swedenborg's, the Swedish Christian minister's experience in heaven and hell. There's a gigantic kundalini experience. But if you want to experience the kundalini, you require certain training. And you require the lower yogas to establish a basis. And then the experience of the kundalini becomes a possibility, in fact, a probability, safely. There is no danger in kundalini arousal if you are in a pure body with pure emotions and a pure mind. There is no danger in this electricity if I know how to use the switches, but I shouldn't put my fingers into the open switches, I'm finished. It's very safe to use matches as long as you know how to control fire, but fire can burn you. Water is a wonderful needed thing, but you can drown in water if you don't know how to look after yourself in the presence of water. So also with Kundalini, as you can be taught water safety, fire safety, electrical safety, gun safety, bomb safety, so also you need to be taught Kundalini safety, which is a part, parcel of the Kundalini experience. More on another occasion. Hari. Hmm? Shiva. Hmm?